The morning star drive on 17.8. You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride, and it's time to fly. So let's realign. Just listen and fill your mind. Hey guys, and how is it going? And welcome to the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. It is Friday, June 2nd, and so happy for you joining us, and we are ready to start another day together with the Lord. So subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on SoundCloud, and make sure to support us on Patreon. So what is happening on this exciting podcast for you today? We have Until the End Mental Health with Daniel Baker. We have the Wednesday Message Word Study. And of course, commentaries, updates, and news on what is happening around the world in this history today. All right, how are you doing? And yes, it's Friday and I'm so happy. Yes, I'm very, very happy. It's the last day of the work week. I do get a break for the next two and a half days. Um, If you haven't yet, go ahead, leave some likes and comments to build our community. Uh, Really happy for everyone joining us every weekday on the Morning Star Drive. So let's get up and support each other each and every day. So uh, yeah, I get two and a half days off just like everyone else in the world. Uh, The last day of the podcast for me is Thursday afternoon, because I'll finish this, uh, I'll get everything set up and done by 2.30 p.m. on Thursday, which is exactly 5.30 a.m. over there in Malaysia, 6.30 over there in Korea. And um, from 2.30 p.m., uh, I have half of Thursday off, and then I have all of Friday and all of Saturday. So uh, it is my weekend starting from Thursday afternoon. So uh, yeah, for me, I love Thursdays. And it's kind of cool because everyone else is working on Friday, but I don't. So it's kind of like a the free day. I get to go out and it's not busy anywhere. I love uh, Fridays for myself, especially in the morning and stuff like that. Uh, how was your Alpha Day, everyone? What did you guys do? Did you guys give glory to God? Did you uh, any church events? I wonder if anyone... Uh, has anything that they'd like to share on uh, the Morning Star Drive podcast or this channel? If you have any poems or anything else you'd like to share, I know Nick over there in Oz uh, has a poem, and looking forward to that one for sure. So yeah, if you guys have anything, would like love to share it. I'm sure many people would be moved and inspired by it. Also, uh, Pravi Puff, uh, their next their their last episode came out yesterday afternoon. So hope you guys are enjoying that. Uh, I, I love these new podcasts, and I think one uh, I had a good friend of mine. Uh, uh, message me about the new podcast and they're like it's so good just to have um, these different types of podcasts but it it what, what is it it inspires more discussion and more conversation I think that's a really really good thing especially for us uh, in the English speaking world where we want to have these discussions this is why when you look in the world today right now this is why podcasts are so uh, uh, popular everywhere right now in uh, in the world itself so Uh, These podcasts allow us to think and discuss with each other. And, you know, any of you guys want to join, go ahead. Go ahead and join. Just uh, text any one of us on those uh, segments or even just email. The emails will be below also. So just make sure you come in and um, uh, we will make sure that, uh, you know, everyone can get their voice heard. And, uh, you know, that if you guys are really inspired, you guys can be on those things. Well, you know, I had a really funny, uh, I had one of the funniest uh comments the other day on soundcloud it was kazune and you know from japan and she said that um you know we're talking about uh warm greetings between the opposite sex not talking about you know talking to them like individually on the phone go meeting them one-on-one like not stuff like that we're talking more of just uh greetings inside the church so it feels warm And she said the most hilarious thing for me. I was howling. And she said that, oh, in our church, some of the guys don't do any. And guess, you know, we're talking about eye contact, right? But you know, she she doesn't just call it eye contact. She says, there are some guys in the church that have no premarital eye contact. (laughs) I thought it was the funny. I I never heard that before. Premarital eye contact. I was howling. It was so funny. And the question she was asking was like, basically, is this just Japan like where guys have like no premarital eye contact or is it in other countries too and for myself honestly I've seen it in Korea not by everyone I just see it uh with some people that are a little bit you know like that are very very careful like there's some people like that uh I've seen in Korea but not anywhere like definitely not in the western countries unless maybe it could be someone who's uh maybe very very careful but very rare and I think most western countries are fine i think 
But let me know. Let me know in the comments below if you have any <laughs> if you guys have any issues with premarital eye contact. <laughs> it sounds like it's such a dangerous thing. Ooh, did you have premarital eye contact? <gasps> dun, dun, dun. It sounds like such like an evil thing when you say premarital eye contact. Like I don't know. So uh, I I I really enjoyed that comment. Either way, uh, also guys remember. We got, uh, don't forget, we have the prayer podcast coming this afternoon too. Go ahead and check that one out. It's going to be talking about the Psalms. So I'm excited about that one also. You know, for me, yesterday was a hard day for, not hard. It was a deep thinking day for me, right? And that uh, deep thinking day meaning, uh, right after I finished uh, recording my podcast, I was talking to a friend in Korea that I helped evangelize. And, you know, you, you probably know the news, uh, what I'm going to say is, yeah, and they just told me they left. And, you know, they're really sad and shocked and they believe everything kind of thing. And, you know, it's kind of like what I talked about in yesterday's podcast that, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that people leave, but we can still be sad because it's people we know and people we love, right? Because like I said yesterday is we don't know what people, you know, what people do in their lives we don't know what their motives are and you know people can change their hearts we don't know when that actually happens so you know we don't control other people we only control ourselves so it's not like surprising when someone has changed their heart it's more of just really sad that it's people that you know and such so it was kind of a downer yesterday right after my podcast I went to the cafe and uh, I got that text message like I texted first just check just to check on them and then they kind of told me everything uh, and you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys out there too, it's not the first, per you know, like it's already June. So it's not like it's the first person we heard, uh, that's left and it's not going to be the last either. Like even d after this difficult time comes, people are going to come and go all the time, all throughout history. Right. And the good thing is we had a very civil conversation. We talked nothing about why they left. It was just checking on them to see if they were doing okay or not. So, uh, you know, that, that was kind of the start after my podcast. You know, my podcast, I'm very, very uh, focused. After that, I was just like, oh my gosh. And of course, that wasn't my whole day. It was just a very sharp part of my day, which is, is quite interesting because uh, psychologists talk about our mem the human memory. And the human brain mainly remembers things that have like high emotional impact. Like, you know, for instance, if you look at, you know, think about all the things that happened last week, we're not going to remember 90% of it. Like, look at your childhood. You don't remember like most of your childhood, but you will remember the really amazing or terrible things that happened when you were young. You know, like amazing things like the first time you went to a baseball game with your dad or uh, sometimes it could be some type of trauma you had in the family and you're not going to remember anything else except for those high emotional events in your life. So uh, yes, yesterday that was my high emotional moment and I remember that one the most. But there was something else I remember too because there's, two, you know, on top, there's like just things that happen on top of each other. Like... Um, my parents, they go on vacation. So, you know, we're eating dinner together. They're telling me like, oh, we're going on vacation for four days starting today. I was like, oh, okay, you know, have a good trip. And, you know, uh, I'm like, I'm going to have a very peaceful and quiet time at home for the next four days. And, you know, I, for me, I'm just super happy that they can really live the retired life, go and hang out with their friends, go on vacation, mini vacations and such. And this makes me really happy to see them enjoying their life like this too. But it was... The con like another shocking conversation with my parents. Like this was shocking. Okay, for me it was just uh yeah it was it was quite shocking to my mind. Right, so after out of nowhere my parents are like uh, uh what are you gonna do if uh, one of us dies? And I'm like w what? I'm th I'm thankful they waited till after dinner. But they're talking about like what if one of us dies? Who's gonna take care of mom or dad? And it was interesting because they were just, it was just a normal conversation of, you know, you know, you know, what if, you know, if dad dies first and then, or if mom dies first, what are you going to do? And they are talking about who should die. You know, like they're even talking about who should die first, <laughs> which is so weird for me. Like my mom was worried that, uh, if she died first, then my dad couldn't take care of himself. How would you help him out kind of thing? And she's kind of hoping that dad dies first. <laughs> I 
was like, I'm like, and they're, they're both kind of like, you know, they're smiling and stuff. And you know that they're talking about it. I'm just like, in my head, I'm like, what a crazy, it was funny and awkward at the same time. It's like, yeah, and then my mom's like, you know, but it's kind of best if we kind of died around the same time. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. And I was kind of like, hey, mom, don't worry about, you know, uh, you know, most likely dad will die first because men usually die faster than women. Like they'll die earlier than women do. Women have a higher, but you know, they're five years apart. And, you know, it's just like in my head, I'm like, are you guys planning to do something? Like, what is going, like, what kind of conversation is this? And my mom is like, you know, we're joking around too, but it's kind of like joking, haha, plus it's kind of serious at the same time. And mom was like, but if I'm healthy, right? If, if my dad dies first and I'm healthy, just give me money and I'll be happy. And we just started laughing and stuff. So, you know, tell me that's not a crazy conversation, right? Tell me that's not a crazy conversation talking about their deaths with them. Right. And, you know, it, it reminds me, yeah, like, you know, how finite we are. And uh, my parents, you know, they're my dad's already 76, just turned 76 uh, last weekend. And then on top of that, uh, my mom, uh, you know, she's 71. So they're at the sunset of life. And I was so shocked in the beginning when they're talking about it, but they were very like open about this. <laughs> And I'm just kind of like, I'm not really thinking, I don't want to, I don't want to think about that at all, right? And, you know, I'm pretty sure with most of you guys out there, you guys aren't thinking about your parents passing away and stuff. Because, you know, you guys are, most of you are a lot younger than me. Your parents are most likely in their 50s along that line, right? So it was a very shocking conversation and funny and awkward at the same time. And, you know, I was trying to lighten it up because, you know, I'm trying to lighten it up for myself, right? Like kind of joking around with it too. But, you know, after that type of conversation, it's already in my head that they're thinking about this already. Yeah, and, and think about that. On, right after my podcast, I hear about a friend from Korea who left. And then on top of that, I have dinner and then I have the conversation with my parents like this. It was a very deep thinking day for me. And it made me think about my future and, you know, the expectations I should have. And like, I even asked my parents, like, don't you guys have life insurance? They're like, no, we don't have life insurance, but it's okay. Right. And then I'm like going, well, yeah, true. It's okay. But, you know, because, you know, they have a house and all the other stuff like that. So I was trying to think about, uh, you know, after that conversation, like, man, what else can I do for my parents? Right. And of course, I know that the most important thing to them uh, as interesting as this, you know, as interesting and not, well, this is not surprising. Their only thing they care about is me. Like uh, the kids, uh, how are they going to be okay? Are they going to be okay? And for me, I'm thinking about, I got to spend more quality time with my parents. But, uh, you know, of course they brought the subject of, hey, when you die, who's going to take care of you? What about, you know, you need kids too to take care of you. You know, we have you guys to take care of us, but you know, who's going to take care of, uh, who's going to take care of, uh, you when you get sick or when you get old. Right. And I'll, you know, I just kind of listened to, it. I was like, yeah, I understand where they're coming from. But, you know, I was just sitting there like, yeah, I understand. But it, it was, it was quite, uh, shocking. Yeah. You, you got to say it's shocking. Right. And I, I just sat there like, ah, oh, that's so true. But it was really kind of sad to, to think about it at that way. I'm not sure. Like, if you guys write in the comments below, what do you guys think? You know, like, when you think about your parents, uh, and I'm sure it's going to be a little bit different for younger people, and then, you know, people in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s. Everyone's going to be thinking very, very different things. But, you know, you know, I would love to see in the comments, you guys write your age. Like, you're in the 20, you're in the teens, 20s, 30s, 40s. And what is your thoughts about your parents? Like, you know, especially like your parents passing and stuff like that. What do you think about how, like, do you spend a lot of time with your parents? How close are you to your, like, I don't know. For me, it was, it's, it's hard to acknowledge that it's getting close. You know what I mean? Because it's your parents, right? So I was just like, wow, it's getting close. And if you think about it, it's the same thing with Sun's name too. Right, and Sun seems like two years older than my dad, and he's like, you know, Sun seems already at like uh, seventy eight, right? And for me, I'm just like, wow, like even Sun seems. Oh, I wonder what like how Sun seems thinks about and what he's preparing for. Not that he's preparing for uh, death, but he's <clears throat> most likely thinking about how 
the rest of the thousand years are going to go on and do they have enough word? Do they have enough material? Or when you hear, you know, when you go into the Wednesday message a little bit, you know, in the next segment, it does talk about, you know, God's will was getting, you know, he had all these plans for the next generations, right? For, you know, for us who are chosen and it just gets shattered by these people leaving and, and uh, losing their faith and such. And yeah, it's, it's something we, it's very interesting for us to think from our perspective, but from God's perspective also, he's thinking so far ahead, right? Like I'm thinking like within the next, you know, if you're 70, most likely my parents, you know, uh, my dad's 76, maybe 15, 15, 15, 20 years, which I think is very, very good still uh, that he's going to be living in stuff. So yeah, yeah. It made me start thinking about Sunseam too because my dad and Sunseam only two years apart. And I wonder what he's thinking also, like especially with this trial, like how much of his, you know, the rest of his life, he's going to spend the rest of his life in there, right? Like is that is that how he's going to spend the rest of his physical life? And that's such a sad thing to think about too. So yeah, it, it, just a lot of thoughts came to mind. And it, you know, the more you think about it, the deeper the mind gets. And it makes us kind of look at that macro, that big picture and say, oh, you know, what is, you know, what's really uh, happening at this moment, right? So that made me think really deeply too. And then at night, I had another great conversation with a, a good friend of mine. And we were talking about... Um, how important leadership is, right? And we're like, what do you mean how important leadership is? Like, like for instance, you know, I've had several talks here and there with different people. And, you know, for instance, let's take a look at an entire country altogether, right? So how important is the leadership? Well, if we were to take a look at who's in charge of the country, then when it comes to, the, let's just say uh, a company, but also in Providence too, uh, there's like the head leaders that set the direction for the church, but then above head leaders, you have HQ and HQ is the place where they will set the direction for the entire country. Like they're not per se in charge of every individual. They're in charge of the entire direction of the country, right? And the leadership of like someone of any organization, like, you know, some seem they're like, they have to have that vision. That's some that big vision that's going to be able to, uh, inspire people to say, this is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm here. It inspires them to do it even more. But you don't have the direction if you don't have the vision, right? Then what happens to people without direction or vision is everything seems like it's, our thoughts become so small that it's just kind of like, ah, it's not a big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. basically people are, are thinking for themselves, like not thinking, they're thinking only about themselves. People who are visionary are thinking about the entire, the whole. They're thinking about the entire church, the entire country, the entire world, God's will. You know, like vision is so much bigger, right? One of the best examples I give about vision is a lot of people are, are thinking, let's just say if you're thinking only individually, it's like, oh, I got to make more money because I need to buy my own house. I got to buy a car. Right. And then people who are thinking about the family are <clears throat> are probably thinking about leaving legacy, not being not legacy, but having something behind so that, you know, like uh, generational wealth or something along that line where there's success in the family that will be able to take care of the kids for next generation, the generation after. So they're thinking about the family. But then, you know, you you have to think even bigger, like for all the things that you have, there's like several steps you have to think beyond. Like when you're visionary, say at a family level, yeah, the visionary is like, hey, uh, the people who are not visionary, just buy a big house because it looks nice. Oh, it shows my status. That's about me, right? But people who are visionary when it comes to their family is like, why'd you buy a house with uh, 10 bedrooms? Right. And, you know, like I said, the individual's like, oh, because it's, you know, like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm wealthy now. I have this money and I can do this, 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 and this. Right. However, someone who's visionary is like, hey, I bought this house. Right. Because family and gathering together is such a big thing for me and for my future generations. I want to have this house that can be passed down where every year, at least, you know, as families, you know, we people move to different areas, but once a year, I got a house with 10 bedrooms because when I take all my, my children and my cousins or my family together, we need about 10 rooms. 
And, you know, I want it so that we can all gather at least once a year. And this is why I want to, you know, have this wealth because I want my family to stay together. You know what I mean? So you see that there's a, a vision, there's a, a reason beyond just having the house for the sake of having a house, right? It's like people have to look beyond. And a lot of times when we don't have that vision, and, I, and I'm going to be super honest with you guys, uh, innovators, visionaries is only 2.5% of the population. Most people don't think that far or that big. And because they don't think that far and that big, uh, you know, it's just natural for them to think just about themselves or something at a very, very small level. Now, I'm not saying that everyone all of a sudden has to be a visionary because only 2.5% are, right? But so what about people who aren't? What about the 97.5% the that aren't visionary? Well, this is what happens in the world. In the world, people who are not visionary <coughs> attach themselves to someone who is a visionary, right? And that's how they gain their vision, by going to people with vision, Example is, look at the world today when it comes to protesting. How many people are, like, say, uh, BLM or, like, discrimination or sexism? Like, you have these big ideas and someone, some visionary comes up with this big idea and then you have thousands and thousands who will attach themselves to that vision, right? And the same thing's got to happen in our churches, in our countries, too, is in order for the country to really, really run well, you need a, you need visionaries up at the top. Visionaries that are seeing beyond just, hey, let's just evangelize more. Hey, let's just do it like this, right? <clears throat> visionaries are thinking so far ahead and they're thinking very, very big, right? And there are so few, like if we were to name visionaries in the world, look at in Elon Musk, right? You'll look at like a Steve Jobs, right? Think about it. Visionaries are the people that you'll look at and you can name them. You can literally name them because they're visionary. On Howard Schultz, right? Like you're going to see these people who are very visionary, but you can name them because there aren't very many, right? And what's going to And think about it. Like you'll have an Elon Musk. He has like 130 million followers on his like uh, Twitter. What does that mean? These are people that like his vision. So like I said, 97.5% don't are not visionary, so they'll find someone to attach themselves to be visionary too, right? Whether it's going to be like a Donald Trump, whether it's going to be uh, Elon Musk or a Steve Jobs or, or, or whoever these big figures are in the world, people are looking for it. But more importantly, when we look at our this history of God, we have a visionary in Sunsunim, right? And that's for the whole but we need visionaries also at the top leading countries, right? When they lead the countries, the whole country has a direction, right? Uh, if there is no visionary, what happens is the leadership at the top are basically just trying to take care of people. And that's all they do is just try to take care of people, making sure everything runs smoothly, but there's no real direction. There's no real like, we're going, we're, you know, this is the direction we're heading towards, right? Like... Uh, the vision, the vision usually is something that is unattainable, as crazy as that sounds. It's something that you'll never get to, right? Like um, uh, a visionary for a father, right? A visionary for a father is, you know, the father is like, I want to be present in everything my child does, right? I want to be that amazing father uh, that is always there for this, that teaches them how to catch, teach them this, 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 and this. And it's such a perfected or such a big goal that you can always get better in it, getting a, becoming a better father, a better father, a better father kind of thing, right? But, you know, it's, it's something that we do have to think about is... Uh, I'm not saying be the visionary because most of us won't be. The vast, like 97.5% are not going to be visionary. But this is why having the right people in leadership plays such a big role because they're the ones setting the direction. Or that direction has to be there. That huge vision has to be there for everyone to move towards. And sadly, as this sounds too, this might, well, not sadly, but this is just the reality is people with big vision are usually the ones that are a bit more stubborn. They're way more perfectionist. They're more, I mean, they could be more narcissistic. Uh, they're, they're pushing and pushing. Like if you think about Steve Jobs, everyone thought he was a total jerk, right? But he was the visionary behind it that made it so, that Apple so big, right? They're going to be eccentric. They're going to be a little bit off. Right, and that's the the type of things that we have to look at and say, oh, that's one of the downfalls of a visionary. But 
Uh, a visionary basically needs a lot of good supporting people, right? And that's how things can get made even better and better and better, right? So, you know, I think it's something where it comes down to the thing is, do we have the right people in the right position? Or do we just have people in there for the sake of we need someone there, right? And uh, I'm telling all of us here is that uh, nothing will really grow that great or nothing will really become something where people are inspired. Like, oh, I can't believe I'm in this country. Oh, yes, I can feel it in this country. This is what we're here to do. It's very, very different. And we have to be those that understand it to that level and say, yeah, that's what we need to do. This is something that's really, really important for us, right? And uh, when people become visionary, what happens is, like when people get a visionary and then they it's a vision that they are all inspired by, there's something that's going to happen uh, that I think most churches, a lot of churches don't have, and that is sacrifice. What does that mean? Put it this way. If you're put in a position but you don't really want to be there, how hard are you going to work? You're going to always try to find the bare minimum of just doing what you think you're supposed to do. And since you did that, you're happy and you're fine. Okay. But let's compare that to something that you really love, you're passionate about. When people love and have passion about something, they are willing to sacrifice, which means let's say that I'm really into coffee. I will spend my own money. I will research on my own time. I will spend more, right? Because I have an interest. I love it. It's something that I'll do, right? However, if I don't really like it and someone's forcing me into it or it's like, oh, I'm here because, you know, uh, you know, that's just why I don't really want to be here. What's going to happen is people don't sacrifice it. They try to find the way to just do the bare minimum. They're not going to put up with a lot of crap. They'll get more angry. They'll, they'll snap at people even more. Why? Because they don't want to be there, right? There's no vision. There's no inspiration. And that's the thing that we need to cut to the next level of is what's the next step we, we need to take? What's the direction we're going in this history? And uh, I, I really hope it's something that, uh, you know, don't you find it really weird that in a Christian church, there are there is a waiting list for people to serve in the church, willing to wake up at like five in the morning to go help set up the praise, willing to come hours before to, you know, get everything set up for church. And they're willing to do it, right? That's a willing thing. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, but when you, you know, sometimes we find in churches in Providence is it's just the same people doing it over and over again. Like the same people always do the volunteer work. The same people over and over again. Or some people are just not willing to sacrifice their time. Right? It's the way that Sunstein put it, Right? When, when people say they don't have time, it's not really they don't have time. It just means they don't have interest, which is not a bad thing. It just means they're not interested, right? So it's like, for instance, uh, the example something gives is if, um, if there's... Imagine your schedule is packed tomorrow. If your schedule is packed tomorrow, yet the girl you have a crush on says, I want to meet you tomorrow, what are you going to say? You're going to say yes, and you're going to move all your other plans aside so that you can meet this girl. So it's not about time. It's about interest, right? If there's a girl that you're not interested in, right? If there's a girl you're not interested in or a guy, whatever it is, and they're like, hey, you want to meet tomorrow? Well, you're going to be like, oh, sorry, I'm busy tomorrow. I have this schedule. You know what I mean? In the end, it's not so much about time. It's more about interest. Because if it's important, people will put it aside to do it, right? And in the same way too, if people don't have the inspiration, like the, the vision, the inspiration, the motivation of why we're here, what we're trying to do in this country, the problem that's going to happen is that uh, not everyone's going to be involved. Like it, It's something that we do need to think about is, is there a vision? Is there someone who's visionary? who's looking to see the, the big direction of the entire country, the entire world kind of thing. Like, what's the vision that we have? And if, we don't, if you don't have that, you're going to see that people are fighting only to exist. Yeah, like, it's say, like say right now, like even in Providence, with this stuff going on, if there's no visionary, if there's no person that inspires and have that motivation of why we're here, and we're all going to agree upon and say, wow, that's the reason I'm here, the problem that happens is, 
instead of people, you know, growing, they're just struggling to exist, which is really sad, especially in the history of God, that if everyone's just struggling just to exist, that's not a good sign. It just means that more and more people are going to drop off because just to exist means you're just trying to hit the line. But you can't be that good all the time. And sometimes you're going to be below the line and a lot more people are going to leave and such. We have to reach that level where the leadership is in a position where people are inspired. People are, you know, want to grow more than just trying to exist, right? And it was just a really, really good conversation. And this friend of mine, I respect so much. And I love this guy to death. And, uh, you know, it's just a discussion of the different things that we've gone through. Right. And, uh, you know, the mistakes we made, how we can do better. And I, I hope it's something that we can really think about also. Right. And uh, I think, yeah, a lot to think about. Right. And, you know, think about that. This is this is my this was just yesterday for me. <laughs> that Those three things that happened was just yesterday. And, you know, I'm thankful that I could talk about it on the podcast, but I hope even more it'll be something where everyone can think more deeply about these things too, okay? All right, so uh, that means we're going to get into, uh, yeah, so those are just a couple of thoughts going through my mind and things that I was thinking about. So I hope that you guys too uh, will think about them uh, even more deeply. All right, so let's move into our first break for today. We believe in the same God, but we are on different levels. Put your hands in the sky if you feel alive All the stories that we made, just you and I Never losing all the passion All this love is my obsession uh, Oh my gosh, this feeling got me heat stroke His love like a billion pots about to heat though I ain't never breaking from this bond Cause you and I are only one So uh, let's get into our second segment for today. And of course, uh, every Friday we do have uh, the Wednesday message word study. And yeah, the, this Wednesday message went really deep. Uh, and I was really kind of surprised and shocked that uh, even the scripture changed to the book of Lamentations. And for those of you guys who don't know the book of Lamentations, like Lamentations is like a poem. Or it's, you know, these writings that are lamenting, right? So if I said to you, what is a lamentation? It's like um, sadness, expression of grief. Um, it's like the expression of grief is usually through weeping or wailing through the scriptures, right? It's a feeling of being sorry or regret. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just pouring out of shimjong. So when you think about like, wow, like someone seems taking it from the book of Lamentations, that's really like a, a big thing for me to think about is, wow, like why would, you know, I think Sunseem right now is probably reading it because he probably 
relates or connects to it even more now than any other time. Like, I don't know all the different things, he, the answers he's getting from his prayers. Or even if God is showing him his future of what's going to happen after all these trials and such. But just the fact he's reading from Lamentations and like we're using it in Scripture for the messages is really something that I think all of us have to think deeply about. It's like, wow, we're in the book of Lamentations and the Lamentation comes from the Scripture, I mean, from the title of Do Not Change, which means that there's this lament, a pouring out of grief, a pouring out of Shimjong because people are changing, right? And I think that is something that uh, uh, we should be thinking and praying about, especially during this 70-day repentance condition. And, you know, as we're doing this, you know, we're, we're getting close to the last, the last end of the 20, uh, like the last 20 some odd days, 20 days maybe left, um, less than 20 days actually. Uh, you know, we're supposed to examine ourselves, like really in detail. And uh, I, I really like that point that was given is we have to look at ourselves so thoroughly that there is no time to look at the person next to us. And I think that's something we might get caught up in because of all the chaos and stuff that is happening, things that we're shocked by, that we're looking at like, how could this person, how could this person, oh, why is this person? It's very, very interesting. And, and I thought to myself is if we really, really examine ourselves step by step, detail by detail, uh, you won't even you won't even have time to look at the next person. You won't even have time to talk about them because you're like, wow, what did I do here? Oh man, I got to think about this. I got to change this. So, you know, uh, it, it's such a big thing where, of course, we are repenting for the next 70 days. But kind of uh, when you look at this week's message, it kind of opens our eyes more to why this is so important at this time is if we don't repent and if we don't examine ourselves thoroughly, we're going to change, right? We're, our, the, our love for God is going to change. Our heart for God is going to change. And, you know, that word keeps coming up. If, if we change, we rot. And if we rot, we die, right? So I hope that um, we don't have a change, that bad type of change towards God, you know? Like, we made that vow to believe. We made the vows to love, right? And that came in a time when we were ecstatic and joyful and happy, and the words were so amazing, but, you know, this love and this vow that we have, you know, it's kind of like it reminds me of what the state of the world is like today. The state of the world is the vow means nothing anymore where people will vow and promise and do all these things and they'll get married, but they'll, they'll, they'll divorce in two years because something, something goes bad. And we have to look at our vows and our love that we have is are we doing this because, you know, are we just doing this because that's kind of like the trend of the time right now to look down on providence and to think twice about your like is that what's happening now or are we the ones that are going to make that vow believe in love even stronger and not change our hearts right especially during this time here and uh I, I really, really hope it's something that we can uh, really think about ourselves. Like, you know, one thing that I, I was really into was during the Wednesday message, it was like talking about Sunstein's prayer and then the different answers that, that God kept giving. Like, he, he was like telling us what God was saying, right? Like, when Sunstein was praying to God about the situation, people changing, and God's like, don't change. Because if you change, it's like food that rots. And then once, and then if it's rotten, we have to throw it away. And if you throw it away, it can't be restored. You can't bring it back to the... It's really hard to turn back to the original state. And if you really change completely, yeah, it sounds harsh, but it's like, yeah, if you change completely, then you're going to be thrown away without regret. Now, this might sound really, really harsh to a lot of people. Like, what? God's going to throw people away? And you have to understand what does it mean to have a completely changed heart? Completely changed, right? That's, that's something completely different than what's in our heart is like, well, God is like so frivolously going to just throw people away left and right. And the answer is no, it doesn't mean that. We already know from reading the scriptures, from knowing God, is that 
uh, how much he loves everyone, how much he truly loves and how much he wants to forgive and forgive and forgive. And, you know, you see it all throughout the Bible, like uh, the thousand times the, the, the people of God have turned their backs on God, there's a thousand and one times he'll take them back. A thousand and thousands upon thousands, right? And what does it mean? Well, Sansim also said is like, what does it mean like God will throw away? It's like, no, it has to get to the point where the heart is completely changed. Like there's no way back, right? It's like in the same way with the tree, uh, a tree is not thrown away until it is completely dead, right? Like there's no, it, it's dead now. It's fully dead, right? Even with human beings, like Sansim talks about when you want to resurrect someone, you have about three to four days max to bring someone back because they're not fully dead yet, right? It, there's there, there's going to be that time where there's even though someone has kind of technically died, they still have a chance. But there comes a point where there's no turning back, right? Where the heart is completely changed, right? And this is the point. Like you're you're talking so far down the line where God will say, "No, I, I there's no there's no point because I've done everything I could with all my heart, will, and life." To, to bring this person back, but it reached a certain point where everything I do won't make a difference anymore. So it, we have to look at it in that sense, right? Because if we think that God will always take someone back, even after they die, which basically means that there's no point of, there's no hell then, because God will, why would God send them if he's, there's, there's always going to be a chance? No, there's, there's a limit, there's a time, Right? So uh, it, it's something we do need to think about. It's not a cruel or frivolous thing where God doesn't think about it. God does everything in his power. The almighty, omnipotent God does everything in his power before it reaches the point where there's a point of no return. Right? And this is something that God basically said to Sunstein. He said, tell this to everyone. No matter what the reason is, if someone changes their heart before me, Jehovah, they'll be thrown out because they've wrought, right? Tell this to everyone. It doesn't matter if you're an individual, a family, a nation. Once your heart changes, it becomes rotten. It's done. And when you rot, you're going to be thrown away, right? So, you know, once once you die, it's so difficult to restore for all eternity. That's why you'll see very few people that actually return. So, you know, I, I, when, when we look at these things, it's, yeah, there's so many reasons. Like, I, I like to, not I liked, but it was very eye-opening to see all the different reasons because it made sense, right? Because, you know, God, the Holy Trinity, and Jesus, Sunstein has given so much grace and love to people, protected us so many times. But people leave because some feel left out. Uh, some people blame others. This is why they've changed. People felt wronged. Right, people have shattered their faith, changed their actions, their behaviors became rotten. I think that's a big thing that we have to look at too. Is it's not just like I said at the beginning of the week is it's not just about uh, you see where the big problem is is when people's entire behavior has has changed, like into this like a rotten behavior. For me, that's really interesting just to see that. Once they change their heart or once they flip to the other side or whatever it is, their character and personality is completely rotten. Not completely, but it's rotten. Just the way they think, how conniving or deceiving they become. And I, you know, I've experienced it firsthand, deceiving. People pretend like when, I, when, you know, when we're talking like January, February, and March, I've had people call me pretending to be confused, pretending to not choose a side, right? And in the end, I find out later, they're the ones that are actually the, the biggest people trying to, they're calling a bunch of people and cursing and swearing and stuff like that. And for me is, there's something, there's something, you know there's something wrong, that if they've shattered their behavior, like just being a decent person, like, it's different if someone's like, I think it's wrong, and they come at it at a very different angle, but they're not cursing people, trying to deceive, uh, trying to make people do something. It's really, really strange for me. Like, to even hear someone say to me, like, 
in the very beginning, I've had people tell me like, oh, you know, we're, we're, we love Providence and we don't want to leave or anything else. And, you know, we want to do this quietly. But then, you know, two weeks later, they're calling everyone. And for me, that's like, yeah, I, I don't think that's, it's, it's very deceiving. Right? They say one thing with their lips, but their actions are completely different. So for me, I, I see something else that's happening, which is a complete changing of like character and behavior, where it be, it's like, how did it get to this point? Right? So, you know, people change. And like the message says, people change and become like rotten food or they're spoiled. You can't eat it. And there's no other choice. When you have food like this and it completely rots, like if there's partial rotting, you just cut the piece of the rotting apple out and you eat the rest. But if it's fully rotted, you just throw it away. There's no other choice, right? And we have to understand is we've come to this point where we have to understand what's been given to us and what we should be still be celebrating even now today. You know, that we have learned the words of this time period. We have confessed with an amen and we believe we're saved from death, saved. Our spirits are no longer in the domain of death. We've achieved the rapture. Like those are things we should be celebrating even now, continuously. And we confessed with our lips we would never change, right? A lot of people that I talk to is like, like even the like the person I the friend good friend of mine I talked to is like yeah yeah oh and I experienced something like that too I'm just in my head I'm just like why would you like if you experienced it already why didn't you talk about it before like why why is it something that uh, came up before like or even said something like hey Pastor Sky this was kind of strange right because you know as we've seen not all of this is from Sunseem. A lot of it is leaders who misunderstand and say oh Sunseem wants this when he doesn't really want it either right. So it's something that we have to understand is if the heart changes completely, then you've kind of turned where the people's hearts have united with, the, with Satan, right? And then what happens is how do you see what happens is, yeah, like probably the most respectful people who've left are those that just leave. And then you have those that have, you know, like now they're going to spend their life trying to to slander and torment something. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Like why would you just go on with your life? So it, it's like the man of mission, you know, this is something that is kind of scary when I, when I was listening to the message for people who leave. Like it makes me want to help them and to talk to them and just have good conversation with them even more. Because why would God let that go? Right? This is the thing. Let's talk about a mental exercise of if then. If then, right? If this history is false, right? And let's say you believe in God. If you believe in God and this history is false, then God will deal with it. Right? Whatever you do is um whatever you do is going to be nothing compared to what God will do to this person. But when I look at what Gamaliel said, who was the chief priest at the time of Jesus, he's like, "Hey guys, if this is actually from God, it doesn't matter what you do because what you're doing is you're going against God. And if you're going against God and you go, if you go against God, the only person that's going to get hurt is you, right? Like you're sitting in a position where you're like, okay, so I left and this has happened here. But if this is true, oh, I'm not going to mess with this because in that, in that case, you're, you're messing with God. Right? What do you think God's going to do to people who shattered his plans? Right? You think if you sh if you shattered God's plans, I I think the cost is unimaginable. You think God and God even said I won't let it go. So, the way God judges and it's so true just look at the world now. He says when God judges, the whole world is in uproar. What is happening now? You know what I mean? So everyone's got to look at the Bible and see. We're going to be astonished and overwhelmed. And it's just, it's already happening, what's happening in the world right now with this condition that's that's happening to Sunseem too. Judgment's coming with one way or another, right? And in the if then, it's either us or them. If, if it's in the, the mental exercise, right? And that's why people have to be careful. Be careful not to slander the other side. Be careful not to do things wrong repent and make sure that we are 
uh, clean in God's eyes. Everything will be judged in the end, right? So, man, like the part that really hit hard uh, when it talked about how God chooses people from your generation, from your line, your lineage, right? Of course, you know, it's like your ancestor, you know, God chooses people from their ancestors. But the interesting thing is, what, what, what the message said is, when God chooses, He chooses one or two people from that lineage, from that family. Only one or two. Isn't that crazy? Like to understand where we stand right now. And from those one or two people, the will of God will unfold for generations upon generations. So if you lose faith, if you abandon your faith, if you shatter your faith, if these chosen people do that, then not just you and your descendants, but your ancestors will suffer too. Because you, and the thing that's like, if you leave, you have no idea when God chooses the next person from that tribe, from that lineage. And it's very difficult to choose again in the current time period. You'll have to wait generations later. But if we stay, we become ancestors of this history. If we, be, if we stay, we become standards that are chosen. That's why we, got, we can't change. Don't change. Don't abandon your faith. Or all the things that we've done is just in vain. Everything that you've done worked hard to even to this point, no matter how big or small it is, it becomes dust. And like God said, it's so hard to choose another person in your generation, from your lineage, from your tribe, your family. And that's why you got to hold on. You have become the leader of your own tribe of faith. Which comes down to, do you realize how valuable and important every person in this history is and how sad it is every person that leaves? Who is the ancestor? When we, we know that Abraham was the ancestor of faith. He held on even when he had to sacrifice his son. Right? We've been called here. And if we stay, the descendants will not cut off for the next thousand years. It's an eternal blessing. We are called, we are chosen to this amazing place, this position in history. And when we truly realize this, this is when your faith remains firm and you go until the end. When you realize that. Which comes down to when you look at yourself and you own like that, that's it. See, this message we just received, it is visionary because he's like, stop thinking only about yourself, that you're the only person that's affected if you leave. You're the only person that's affected if you stay and you haven't done much in it. Like, stop thinking so small. You are affecting people who have already died, you are affecting descendants down the line of history. You need to understand how big you are. And it's not about how many people you evangelize. Did you go to every morning? No, it's got nothing to do with that. We have to do well until the end. And we're not just us. Our descendants will keep receiving blessings for generation upon generation upon generation. So we got to look back. Last 45 years, for me, that's my entire life, because, you know, I was born in the same year as Providence. We can't change. If we change, then we rot and understand what this is all saying. Look at yourself, self-reflection. Has anything died? Has it, does anything need to come back to life? And once we get those things, repent and change those things, we're not going to die in those areas anymore powerful message and it, it's, it was so visionary like Sunseam is the greatest visionary and I hope it's something that we get to see too beyond ourselves we are affecting descendants and you may not like for instance you may not be the big person 
like, you know, like what you think, like, oh, evangelize this many people, whatever it is, but it could be your descendants that you set the condition for. And what they do affects you too because that's, you know, everyone affects their ancestors, not only just their descendants, but also the people who've already died. And they're all living off the backs of your condition too in this history. Either way, powerful message. I, oof, that was something that I, I really looked at, looked at very, very uh, deeply too. And uh, lots of, de and you know, that uh, that day when all those things happened, it all happened on the Sunday, on the Wednesday message day. So, you know, it was very, very powerful either way. So uh, there it is. That is the end of uh, today's word study for the Wednesday message. Hope you guys really enjoyed that. Uh, so let's move into our second break for today. <music>
right. So let's move into our last uh, last segment for today. Uh, our third segment, of course, every single Friday, uh, we have Until the End Mental Health Podcast with Daniel Baker over there in Korea. Uh, I keep confusing him because I met him when he was super young. Uh, he's 19 now. He's a man, right? And uh, man, he's uh, doing such a great job on this. And he's going to do Until the End, and he's going to be talking about Alpha Day and such. So I hope that you guys will really enjoy this. Please welcome all the way over there from Korea, Daniel Baker with Until the End. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Do It Until the End podcast. Now, uh, as of the day of the recording, today is Alpha Day. And Alpha Day is such an amazing day because it um, it is 45 years, right, of Providence starting and this new history starting. And um, today was a very interesting day because I was able to go to the live service in Wormendong and it was a lot of fun. Uh, I was really able to uh, realize the deep meaning uh, behind Alpha Day and, you know, how uh, Alpha Day how uh, the tradition of celebrating Alpha Day came through when Pastor Inte uh, sent sent him a letter in 2014 about how we should celebrate or how, you know, know, he was asking to send him what was the way should we celebrate Alpha Joy. Um, And yeah, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, I was able to have some pretty deep talks with the SS, uh, meeting them, meeting with the SS leaders, or SS teachers too, uh, it was a lot of fun, and yeah. So in the theme of Alpha uh, Alpha Day and um, the start of Providence, uh, one of the big things that you know I really enjoyed during the service was the ending um, was the ending video, and the ending video was a compilation of Sunzame during the early days pre two thousand, and yeah, that gave me a lot of things to think about because you know as a second generation and as a person who was born in 2003 you know I really thought about you know pre-2000 Providence and I realized that I would give a lot I would give a lot of just everything you know to really see something work and really see something build up Providence and yeah from the early days and you know, I really want to give glory and thanks to the Trinity because if Alpha Day didn't happen and if this whole new history did not happen, then I wouldn't be born. You know, I would I would be a different person, you know. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't even be having my consciousness and I would, a lot of things would have changed if this history did not happen. And this is something I realized and it's something that when after I watched the videos, I was like, uh, I I talked with my head pastor and I, I said, I really want to watch a lot of the old and sermons that Sensei gave because it really gives me hope. And it, it, it's sometimes there's a disconnect between you know new providence and old providence that because I wasn't experiencing the old providence that I really don't know and. Uh, even even seeing that short compilation really gave me a lot of strength and I, I hope everyone got a lot of strength from that. Now as everyone might remember this week or the first week of every month is book review or book recommendation whatever you want to call it and in the theme of Alpha Day I want to recommend a book that I don't know if it's actually translated in different languages in English but it's a book that really gave me a lot of inspiration. And as I was reading it during May, uh, it, it gave me a lot of insight about one particular perspective of Providence. So the title of this week's book is Peace Football. It's a book that Sensei released, um, I think it was in the early 2000s, right? Uh, let's see. No, it was actually 2013 when it was released and this book really changed how I look at football and how I looked at soccer Uh, for those Americans I will use those words interchangeably and it's 
uh, this book is really fascinating because we can see what does Sun Sim think while he plays soccer? What does Sun Sim do? And why does Sun Sim use a lot of time uh, playing soccer, right? So let's get into this book review. Now let's go into why Sun Sim started playing football or soccer. Now, God told Sun Sim to play soccer. It is because of health. You know, there was a, a long time where Sun Sim was indoors uh, using very thick chalk and was teaching the Bible during those times. And what happened during those times was because he was indoors and always taking in the chalk and um, it was really destroying his lungs. And what happened was his lungs got so bad that uh, what really helped him was exercising. You know, going outside and taking in the dirt, you know, go just going outside and going on the dirt field and exercising really helped his lungs. One interesting thing that Sazim said was he looks he looks at jogging or playing soccer as giving glory to God. Now, this is very interesting because, you know, it, let's say, you know, you're if you're a parent, right? And you have a child that's 20 years old, right? And it, what what kind of feeling would you have if your child is very have some really big physical issues and has to be in a wheelchair every day? You know, it really it would really be feel bad. So as you're healthy, as a really healthy people, it is one of our responsibilities to give glory to God through exercise. And that's what Sazim said, and that's why Sazim plays a lot of soccer slash football. And one of the big reasons why Sazim is playing, played soccer so much, was to le uh, learn about life, was to learn about how to operate providence. And one of the interesting things was, is within sports, within team sports especially, you're able to really learn a lot about leadership. So whatever it is, whether if it's volleyball, even if it's soccer or football, those team sports, if you're especially in a leadership position, which I've been for both volleyball and soccer, then you're able to learn a lot about how to manage people, how to make people move in certain ways, or how to uh, take care of lives. Those are all things that Sensei learned through soccer, which is very interesting. Through kicking a ball and through... Um, it seems like a very you know, meaningless, meaningless thing, right? To, uh, with a lot of, uh, it's a, like a, a, a big meaningless game that has a ton of rules that, why would you learn that? Why would you use your time for that? But through sports, Sensei realized that we can learn a lot about life. And that's what I've always thought of sports. I've always been competitive with sports, um, but I've always tried to find something from from our lives. And I think some uh, since I'm watching Sunzaim close up playing soccer and all of those stuff and being with Sunzaim on the field, um, also getting rebuked a couple times because I didn't make a good play. <laughs> um, the, I think that kind of thing rubbed off on me and I kind of uh, brought that into my sports life too you know trying to learn from team sports from volleyball from soccer and trying to learn about life through sports yes and this whole soccer and football is just so fascinating to me because Sun Zayim used it in such an interesting way it's like his own testing field on how to run providence how to run uh how to like uh, what Sazim really emphasizes, you know, in playing uh, soccer while he's playing soccer is connection with the Lord. And with any leadership position or any high-ranking 
position in you know headquarters you really need to be connected with god i think that's one of the main things that um that's why sin's aim is always you know always participating and always in in the soccer games he's always you know f- asking the holy spirit where i should where should i go where uh what where should i go in this instance or uh, who should I pass to? Who should I? When should I score the goal? Where should I go? Those are all questions that you know the Holy Spirit can answer, and that's something uh, leading by example. You know, not only for the people who are on the field, but for all leaders in Providence. You know, that's why he's playing soccer. He's a leader, right? He's leading by example, and that <laughs> for me. You know, that's very inspiring, right? As a, a future leader, as a current leader for the Wormadong SS, that's very inspiring. So to wrap up this book review, I would 100% recommend this book if you want to be any ki- any type of leader, right? If you want to be a providence leader, a head head pastor, if you want to be um, SS leader, campus leader, or if you want to be, you know, anything related to um, saving lives, taking care of lives, I 100% recommend that you read this book because it doesn't just talk about soccer or football as a, as a low level, as, you know, there's a hundred soccer podcasts on the internet right now. You know, it's very low level because they don't talk about the deep deep realities about what's going on on the soccer field and how Sanzim uses soccer to really set an example for all leaders in Providence. Now, this is very interesting. So if you want to be any, any type of leader uh, within Providence or within the world, read this book. 100% recommend it. And this is why I'm... This is going to be one of my favorite books. You know, there's also a lot of Sunsames pictures about like the the pre-2000 era. era. It's a lot of fun. You know, I think I see my father in one of these. Uh, in um, so on 204, right? The Hawaii, the Hawaii picture. It's a very interesting and familiar face. You know, <laughs> seeing uh, seeing Sunsame there, and I see my father. <laughs> You know, uh, if, if you guys know my father, you can see him in like an instant. It's very fun if you have the book. So, yeah, peace soccer, peace football, whatever you want to call it. You know, I 100% recommend this book. So, yeah, Alpha Day, you know, in the theme of Alpha Day, you know, I kept it very spiritual. And one of my favorite books or favorite Sensei books uh, was talked about today. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast episode and thank you everyone and thank you Pastor Sky and everyone who listened to this episode. Uh, To everyone who's going until the end, let's walk this path together. Peace out guys. Bye-bye. And thank you so much, Daniel, for another wonderful podcast on Until the End, talking about Alpha Day. Hope you guys really enjoyed that. If you have any things you want to say, go ahead, leave a comment for Daniel below. All right, everyone, that is it. It is the end of the entire week. Hope you guys enjoy your weekend. Uh, Everyone, uh, love everyone, and I hope that we can continue to build this community more and more. And we'll see you guys on Monday on the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. The morning star drive on 17.8. You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride, and it's time to fly. So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm like this. I got my head in the zone, you know. I'm on the morning star drive.